Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Saren, and I work for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources at the Outdoor Adventure Center in downtown Detroit, which is where I am this morning. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to be going over the Amazing Arthropods event. Uh, a couple things before we start. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand if you have that option in your uh, video recording um, software. Uh, but we'd like to hold questions till uh, two points in the presentation. You can also type questions in the chat and we will get to those questions at that point. So please hold off on that if you can. Please make sure you're muted and your videos are off. And then we are recording this. So this will be posted um, on the Amazing Arthropod Science Olympiad site. So you can refer to it at a later date. Uh, there will also be a PDF available. So there are some links to materials here in the presentation. You can use a PDF to reach those links. Most of them are also available on the Amazing Arthropods webpage. So we're going to get started here. If we're ready to go, John, was there anything else we needed? We're good. Okay, here we go. And now it won't page. There we go. Um, so just by a raise of hands um, using the software, if you can, please. Um, how many of you have participated in this event before? Okay, a few of you. So we've got some people who are new to this, some people who have done this before. For those of you who have done this before, the rules have changed slightly. We'll go over those changes. For those of you who have not participated before, this will be your introduction to this event. And uh, again, if you have any questions, we'll have two spaces during the presentation and then after. If you don't get your question answered today, if you come up with some later, there's also a place on the website to post questions. And we do that so that everybody who asks a question it gets answered for everybody who's participating in this event. So that's a very important thing to do. All right, so the purpose of this event is to introduce students to arthropods. So that's insects and other uh, members of that group, get them to do some scientific work on their own and actually develop a collection in the way that we would as scientists. So they get familiar with the arthropods, um, both in terms of their characteristics, their ecology, how they interact with people, and then get to put together a presentation of their own. So they'll have a collection. The event rules are posted. We're going to go over those in just a little while. Um, there are two parts to the event. There is a test, which takes about 30 minutes of the event. It is stations that they will rotate to as their team from one to the next, answering questions on a zip grade form, which I'll show you in just a bit. And they're um, just to fill in the blank in the little bubbles. So it's like a, any form you've taken for a quiz or a test. They will need a number two pencil to fill in those little blanks. And then at the end, one of the stations will be a tiebreaker where they will write in words to fill in the blank. Um, so they should bring a pencil with a good eraser because if they want to change their answer, that needs to be erased very well. They are allowed to bring a note sheet, eight and a half by 11, with information on both sides. And I'll give you an idea of what that could look like that might be helpful. They will also bring to the main event in May their arthropod collection. That will not be needed for the practice events that are being held in March. So no collection comes to the events for practice in March. The collection is only for the main event in May. So there's the zip grade form. You can see how it's set up. They'll fill in the bubbles with their pencil for each station that they're at. It is good to remind them, and I will do it at the uh, event too, that they start at whatever station they're at. So if they start out at station number nine, they want to fill in bubbles at station number nine and go from there. That's a little tricky for them. So um, there is a zip grade form on the website. You can download and practice with them so they know how to use that form. So um, for the event, there are two tables on the rules page. Table one lists the arthropod groups 
the main groups that they need to um, recognize the classes and they will need to know the members of that group visually and know their key characteristics. So how many legs, antennas, whether or not they have wings, things like that. And then there's a separate table for specific insect orders in which species are listed and they will have to know how to identify those species and some of the characteristics of those species. Um, basic classification information. So kingdom phylum class order, family, genus, species. When we get to genus and species, how that was um, developed by Carolus Linnaeus and then how we write it in italics and basically what that means. We're going to talk about a key that they're going to use for the um, event this year. A little bit about how you collect arthropods and what tools you can use. That's mainly for the collection. Um, basic anatomy and we're going to have a focus on respiration. So there's different types of respiration that different arthropods use. Life cycles, very important for this event, especially this year. How arthropods do self-defense, either um, outwardly or they do something like curl up and fall down or they match their background. Whether they're native or non-native, uh, endangered, threatened, or a species of special concern. And I can give you some pointers on websites that you can use to get that information. How they impact our economy, because a lot of um, insects in particular are pests and they also may transmit diseases. So you need to know about them. And then what we do to kind of mitigate that in terms of not only using chemicals, but also using other arthropods, um, beneficial, what we would call beneficial insects and others. So here are the classes and orders that we're doing this year. Um, the specimens at each station may either be photos or real specimens that are pinned and preserved or in vials. Um, they will not be able to touch those specimens, but they'll be close enough that they can see all the features that they need. They should uh, understand for each class and insect order, basic biology like their life cycles and anatomical features that identify the insects or arthropods as belonging to those classes and orders. and this uh, time, especially, we're going to be looking at the importance of habitat for some of these. Uh, one class has changed. We're putting in uh, Branchiopoda this year in place of Columbola. And then for the insect orders, we're putting in Trichoptera in place of Siphonaptera, um, which was fleas. So no fleas this year on the test. In terms of the insect orders, um, there's going to be a focus on Blatidea, which is cockroaches, and Mantidea, Mantid anatomy. There are workbooks online at the site, so you can take a look at what uh, features for each of those groups the students are responsible for. And then for the orders that we have here, uh, Ephemeroptera, Megaloptera, Neuroptera, and Trichoptera, we'll be looking at adults and juveniles. They're very specific. Um, easy to distinguish from one another for the most part. For the Trichoptera, we will not be looking at adults. There's too much similarity among them. So we will only be looking at their juveniles because they are very, very distinctive. Many of the organisms in these four groups also need specific habitat and we use them for water quality analysis. So there will be questions regarding those and what it means if you find them in a body of water. Is it good water quality, medium water quality, poor water quality? Um, it's pretty easy and straightforward. And then again, for these basic biology, including their life cycles and anatomy. Um, that's a trichopteran. We know them as caddis flies. They're known for the different cases they build when they're in their larval state. So that's what makes them easy to distinguish from one another and part of why they're on the test this year, because they're pretty cool. And it's nice to know about them. So at some of the stations, we will have this key. It's a what we call a dichotomous key. So if you start at the top, you would ask yourself the question or the students will be asking themselves this question. Um, you can see it says shells or no shell. So they'll look at the specimen. 
determine which one that is, go to the next step down. So if it's a no shell, they'll go to the next step and ask themselves, does it have legs or no legs and so on. So that key will be there. It is posted on the website so you can practice with it. And I have a link for it in the presentation, which will be also in the PDF so you can just click on it. So you'll see that link right there at the bottom. It's a hot link. So if you pull up the PDF, click on it, it takes you right to this key. This is something we use as scientists. It's very important. So this is a helpful tool for the students to begin to learn to use. It also is a nice way to get them to not to have to memorize things. If they can use the tool, it really helps a lot. Um, some of the insects on here are adults. Some of them are juveniles. So it's good to be able to distinguish between those two as well. Again, for the insect uh, orders, some of them have specific species. These species are chosen to be relatively either common ones or ones that have something significant about them. So you can see the list here, um, each of the individual species. Typing in the name of the species, particularly the scientific name, is the best way to find them online for background information. Sometimes common names are used for more than one species. So typing in the scientific name should get you to that species and pretty much scientific data on them. The ones that are highlighted in black are new this year because we changed the insect uh, classes each year. And when we get down to the uh, arachnids and there, you will see some that are not highlighted. Those were on the test last year. The ones in bold are on the test this year. Those rotate from year to year. And then the new class, Brachiopoda, down at the bottom. Um, those are fairly easy to distinguish from one another. They're very different in appearance um, and they're very unique. So make sure again, uh, you're gonna look at their habitat. So what's important, especially for the insect orders um, and the Brachiopoda, I wanna bring that up right now. So the Brachiopoda, very specific habitats. Um, maybe what they do in their ecosystem, are they a predator or a prey? Are they a detritivore, a carnivore, an herbivore, an omnivore? What do they eat? And then are they endangered in any way, a species of special concern, native or non-native? All right, at this point, we're gonna pause and ask if there are any questions about um, the rules as I've gone over them and any of the basic test questions that the students may encounter. I don't see anything in the chat and no hands raised at this point. Okay, thank you, John. If you do come up with questions oh, later, oh, we have, a hand. Hand. we have a hand. I see a hand. Andrea, if you'll unmute and ask your question. Yeah, sorry, and I apologize if I missed this, but when they're naming for um, for the visual part of it, is it the common name or the science? Are, are we looking for the scientific name? It will be a common name. Okay. Won't use the scientific name. Good point. Thank you. And they won't have to write it out at any point. Okay. So perfect. it will be like multiple choice questions or a true and false question um, identifying either a picture or a specimen. But by common name. So common the name only. More for us to find the info and research yes. on it to teach them. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good question. Does anyone else have anything? Again, if you think of something later, please post it to the website and that allows everybody else to have the same answer to that question. All right, so again, the collection is not for the practice um, events, only for the main event in May. But I wanna go over this for everyone so that you know what to expect um, in putting together your collection, which hopefully they are doing at this point. So we are going to look very carefully that they are presented um, correctly. So either pinned or jarred, and I'll go over that. Um, and they can either be uh, dead specimens or they can be photographs. But in either case, that has to be done by the students. This is a student event. You can coach them, you can help them along, but this is for a chance for the students to become scientists on their own. In this case, pretty much entomologists. We don't have a special name for arthropods on the whole, but, um, and it's either one or the other, specimens or photos, not a mix of the two. We have to make sure the team number and the student's name are on the collection and easy to find because that's the way we're gonna start grading them uh, and assigning points. 
So we really need that. Um, the specimens must be found, whether they're photos or um, dead arthropods, in the Great Lakes region. So either they're non-native invasive species here or they're native species. Um, you can use any of the specimens then that are found here. They do not have to be the species that are listed in the event rules in table two. So it goes well beyond that. We'll go over the, the grading form and you'll see how that works. But not any specimens that come from a pet store or that you've had as pets. I've been asked about Madagascar hissing cockroaches multiple times. No Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Um, if, the species, if the individual is an immature specimen, it must be one that resembles an adult. So a young grasshopper looks just like a mature grasshopper, except that it doesn't have um, the equipment that distinguish it as a male or female, and it doesn't have wings, but it's easy enough to identify it as belonging to grasshoppers and thus Orthoptera. But if you have specimens that go through complete metamorphosis and have a larval stage that does not resemble the adult, then that is not submittable for the um, collection. And that would include things like caterpillars, grubs, any larva that does not look like the adult. Um, and then that also is true for specimens that undergo um, what we call incomplete metamorphosis, like a dragonfly or a mayfly, where again, the immature form does not resemble the adult. There is a breakdown in the uh, Amazing Arthropod Study Guide as to the different life cycles and what those words mean. I do not expect the students to know the more scientific terms, which you will see here are parometabolis, holometabolis, or hemimetabolis. If they know um, gradual, complete, and incomplete, that's sufficient. And then um, all of the specimens should be within the prior year not things from previous years. I have collection, I have photos of last year's collections. If I have any questions at any point, I will go back and look at the photographic record I have. So please make sure they're new specimens. And again, you're there to coach and help and support them, but this is for the students to do on their own so they can be scientists in their own right. Um, we'll go over what this looks like, but all the specimens need to have this information on a tag adjacent to the specimen, um, hopefully below the specimen, so it's easier for me to see which tag goes with which specimen. And that includes um, the date that it was collected, month, day, year, the location, state, county, and near city, um, because this is the way we do it scientifically. A little bit about what they observed the insect doing, if they found it already dead, maybe where it was, um, if they took a picture of it, what it was up to, and then the name of the collector. So one of the student names should appear there. They do not have to identify each individual specimen to species, no. So for the um, most of the arthropods, they will go to um, class, and then for class insecta, they will go to order, and that's as far as it goes. No species names needed, please. It keeps extra extraneous information off of the tag. So that's all they need. And then in um, the photographic and the specimen collection, they're going to be grouped by their class and then for insects by their order. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a bit. Um, there are specifications for the collections. They should be for the specimen ones in a sturdy box. Um, it doesn't have to be wooden. A pa copy paper box is fine. And they need a pinning substrate, so like styrofoam, something that the pins will stick in and not wiggle around. Um, there are professional insect pins available in the quick starter kits that you can buy online through Science Olympiad, and they're also vials. The vials are tiny tubes, glass with a screw top, and they are for only soft bodied specimens, so not tiny insects, and for classes other than insecta. So if you find a little crayfish or a pill bug, those should go in the vials um, with preservative fluid. To get the information for how to do these things, there are videos posted online to show you how to pin insects correctly, how to use the vials, what kind of preservative fluid you should use. If you have already dead specimens that you found, you can actually relax their bodies because if you try and pin them right now, they're hard and they'll break apart. 
you can relax the insect bodies, pin through them and put them in the, the case. So there are videos online to walk you through that process and actually walk the students through that process. Um, there are a few other things that I'll go over briefly, but that's the basics. And again, if you have any questions, please post them online or you can ask me at the end of this section. So here are some different ways of pinning the insects properly or other arthropod specimens, usually through the thorax. Um, that's the toughest place, um, not in terms of difficulty, but in terms of the integrity of the insect or other specimen. So right through that space, it is good if you can to collect more than one. So if your first specimen completely breaks apart, and you're just getting used to it. Fine. If you find some really terrible looking ones, you want to practice on them. That's a really great idea. Very tiny specimens, something like a mosquito or a gnat can be on a triangle of paper or um, cardstock is best because it stays stiff and they just get glued to the end, as you can see here in the picture. And then the pin goes through the broader end of that little triangle. Um, there's a great resource through Purdue University that walks through all of this as well. It's posted here. It will be a hot link in the PDF so that you can get to that resource. So this is what a typical collection would look like. Um, this is just an insect one. So if you had arthropods, they would be underneath their little group. So if you have a crayfish, Malacostraca, along with a pill bug, which would also be in that group. Um, if you had a different arthropod class, the name of the class and the specimens beneath. And then for class um, Insecta, that should be a separate tag going across the whole section to identify those as being in the insect class. And then the individual orders, as you can see here, have their tag above, and then the specimens that in that class or uh, order grouped together with their tags immediately below them. The tags can either be below and pinned through or just below um, the specimen in the box so it's readable for those of us who are going over everything. You'll see the vials there have pins on them to keep them from rolling. That's really important. And then a label would go on the jar so that we can see the specimen, but also see the information that's needed for each of those specimens. You can see some tiny specimens here have even been pinned. Um, so that's the way it should be visually for us so that we, as we're going over it and scoring it, it's easy for us to score. If it becomes a challenge to score, that's going to make things a little harder for us to keep track of everything and there may be point deductions. So again, you can either put these labels directly below the um, specimen and put the pin through it or below in terms of here's the specimen and then the label is in the box or on the photograph right below it. So it's easy to see. Um, I know that it's hard to write these and students are maybe not as good as typing, but if you can give them a little form that they can fill out on the computer, most of them are keyboarding at this age, right? So they can type that information in easier for us to read, easier for them to make changes if they need to. It's not required though, they can handwrite them, but it should be as legible as possible. For the photo collections, um, you can put them in a photo album or on a poster. The poster should be no bigger than two foot by three foot. And then please list the camera and lenses used for each specimen. Um, the photos should be focused so that we can actually see the specimen clearly, and then we can see the features that help the students identify that. Please crop out, have the students crop out any excess background so it's just focused on the specimen and only one specimen at a time in the photo. If there were more there, just have the students crop them out. So this is basically what a poster might look like um, with the, them grouped again by their um, class and then by order for Insecta labels with the information needed beneath. All right, because we are scientists, we want to collect responsibly. These guidelines are online. What you land up doing, you're going to do, but please try not to collect too many live specimens in one area. If you find, you know, a dozen grasshoppers, you can take two or three, but try not to collect all of them because they need a population in order to reproduce, especially if it's a species um, that may be in a lower population number. Try not to disturb the habitat that you're going through. Be careful of the things around you. 
And then also um, make sure that you're responsible in terms of the property and the property owners. Please try not to collect in parks where it's not permitted. Um, but again, I, I, I won't be able to see that. So please, I'm just kind of trying to give the students um, good techniques as a scientist would do. You can use traps. There are all kinds of different insect traps, pit traps, um, bottle traps that you can use that do preserve a pretty good specimen. You are welcome to do those, but please check them regularly so you don't have too many dead um, specimens there and you haven't killed off more of a population than you need to. And then as you collect the specimens, try to get the students to keep notes right then and there. And that will help later when you go back to figure out, oh, what do I have to put on this tag? What specimen number is it? If you're collecting live specimens, you can also put them in the freezer to hold them until you're ready to pin them so you don't have them sitting out for an extended period of time and they don't uh, go bad on you. So you can use a freezer and then you can relax them after they thaw using the techniques that there's a video for online. The scoring for this event has changed slightly. We took a little more weight off of the test and put a little bit more on the collection, not a whole lot, but we wanted to balance it out a little more. Um, on the test, there'll be um, three to six questions at each station for 19 of the stations, and then a fill in the blank on three to six questions for the tiebreaker at one station. And each question may be assigned a value of two or three points, depending on the difficulty of the question, and that helps um, balance that out as well. The collection has changed the most. So now, instead of the original number of points, there were for each unique class in the um, arthropod classes, they will get four points, and that does not include the insects because they're going to be scored by order. Three points for each unique, unique insect order, up to 10 orders. And again, those do not have to be specimens from table two on the rules. They can be any insect specimen belong to any order. So if you find a flea, you can include that. Um, the also get um, one point per each unique specimen. So if you have two monarch butterflies, that would be one point because they're the same species. They're not unique specimens. And then 20 points for the quality of work and adherence to the guidelines on the rule sheets. Also, um, if anything is not there, um, I have the discretion to um, deduct points, especially if it looks like it was put together by an adult. And you can kind of tell, but most of the students have a good time doing this. And so give them what they need, be there to support them, but please let them do it because this is their event. This is what the scoring sheets look like. They are online, so you can download them, um, take a look at them, practice scoring them if you want to with the students. Um, there is a link for the policy of this event um, collection being designed and built by students. And then um, the other end of this, where you see down here, it's kind of cut off. Um, there are the individual arthropod classes, whether it is present or not in their collection, any comments as to um, how it's represented, and then the points awarded for having that class represented. Same for the insect orders. Down here, you will see other. So those are other orders that may not be on table two. So if you find a flea, it's an order Siphonoptera. You can include that right in what the order is. And then, yes, it's present or no, that's what I will mark. I will mark any comments and then I will award the points. And then there's a table below for each of the unique specimens to click those off um, and make comments there as well. So you will see clearly all the points assigned and how and why and where they were assigned. Just some hints. Um, some groups are quite large and have a lot of members. Great, you'll find them pretty easy to collect. Maybe not this time of the year so much, um, but that gives you some leeway for collecting those. You can focus on those fine, but the more orders you have, the more points you will get up to the maximum number of points. I should scoot back here for just a minute. Um, there is a maximum, so up to 10 unique orders for the insects, um, up to five unique classes, which would be representative of all of these for um, 
the arthropods other than insects. All right. So, um, and some will be found in winter. You know, look between your window screens and the outside. You might find some there down in your basement. There'll be some there. They're, they're hanging out. Um, looking underneath logs when they're not frozen, <laughs> you're likely to find some there. So take a look around um, in buildings. I know some of the buildings and one of the places I used to work as cockroaches. So you might find some there as well. On the back side of the rules will is the um, or on the scoring sheet is the scoring sheet for the collections. So we've kind of gone over this. Um, there's a space for me to comment on each thing as to why points may have been deducted. So all the collections will start out with the maximum number of points and then points will be deducted if they are not adhering to the guidelines in any way. Um, and that's overall and per specimen. If there's a specimen is not labeled or not labeled correctly, there will be individual deductions for those um, in that. Um, and then there are places for me to comment on anything else overall for the collection. Um, the collections have an overall possible total of 100 points. And so you can see how that rolls out. And there we go. So if I were to score this particular collection, there's only one class represented, so that would be four points. There are nine orders represented here and 30 unique specimens. Uh, some of the specimens were missing information, so there was a point deduction. In and beyond that, all other criteria were met. So this collection would get a total of 81 points, which is pretty good out of 100. It doesn't look like much, but obviously it's very neat, tidy, correctly labeled. Um, the vials are used correctly. So that one did pretty well. As a poster, this one has three different classes, Insecta, Arachnida, and Melocostraca represented two orders among the insects, 10 unique specimens. Uh, one photo wasn't cropped very much, so this little spider here doesn't show up as clearly as it could. Other than that, all other criteria were met, and so that was awarded 48 points. Hints and tips. Start early on collecting. I know it's already January, so this is a little late in saying that, but studying for the test also you want to start early. So start out with the classes, their main features and characteristics until the students feel like they've got those down pat, then move on to the insect orders and then on to individual species. So the test will cover all those things very broadly. So if they got their classes and their orders down pat, that's pretty much two thirds of the test. Um, getting down to individual species, that's between 30 and 40% of the test. Um, suggest the students work as a team. If there's more than one student, you have a team of two on there, um, divide and conquer, have them specialize in different things. It is a really good idea for one student to fill out the zip grade form. So it's consistent from station to station. That student carries it with them, fills out the circles as they go along. So instead of handing it back and forth between the two students, practice answering time questions. The stations are timed, so they will have time at each station, will rotate. It makes students nervous sometimes. So get them in the habit of rotating. Um, quiz them. There's online quizzes you can use, make up quizzes, have the students quiz each other and make up quizzes. I find that at least for the students that I've worked with, if they are making up the questions for each other, then they're more likely to know the answers to those questions and be more confident and know um, how it's going to go. And then again, if you have some things like you find six dead centipedes downstairs, collect them, practice on them, and that way um, you have some that if they're not good specimens, you have some others to practice with and get to the point where you would have a better specimen. All right, any questions about the collection and scoring of the overall event? And you can put it in the chat, raise your hand with the little icon. We have a question. Rachel, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi, um, you mentioned being able to collect other insect orders. Yes. Are we also allowed to collect from other classes? For example, last year we did Columbula. Would that count in the scoring or only the ones represented on the list? Only the ones represented on the list. Okay. 
And Columbo is a really tricky one, especially when it's a photographic one. They usually aren't clear enough to really distinguish that they are springtails. Um, and there are some other things that look like them. So um, that's why that one's off the list. Though we might get some after this snowstorm, I don't know. Um, but that one's a really tricky one to find. There are other, or, um, just the orders that are there are mainly what you'll need. Um, the brachiopodas will be the most difficult to find this time of year. But if we have a good melt in the spring, most of those are in vernal pools. But again, uh, ask before you collect if you're on private property. Um, so those should be um, pretty easy to find at that point in time. But that's a, that's going to be a spring one. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Tina, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, I was just wondering if a um, collection, a photo collection gets as much points as the bug collection. And also, yes. can they be mixed if you can't find or catch or, you know, can't be mixed? OK, no, no mixing of the two because there's a separate set of point values assigned to how they're put together. So that I wouldn't be able to, to do that, balance those out. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, a, a photographic collection is weighted as much as a specimen collection. So they're even, even in the number of points assigned to them. There's just slight differences in how they're scored because of the way they're set up. But in terms of the number of classes, number of orders and number of specimens, they're exactly the same. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Paul, you can ask your question. Hi, good morning. Thank you for doing this. Um, oh, actually, right on. question on photo collection. Um, I noticed that you show an example earlier. Where would you like the camera information to be shown? Is it on the individual species or is it at a higher order if they were all yep. done by the same camera? If they're all done by the same camera, same lens, it can just go within the collection. So if I go back here for just a minute, um, you can see in this example, Right here at the very bottom in the middle, it says all photos taken with the Samsung Galaxy smartphone. So if it was the same device for everything, that's admissible. If it was different Thank for you. different ones, yeah, I'd like to see the differences. Oops. All right, any other questions? Yes, hi, um, this is Paul Hooven. I wanted to ask if there is any kind of opportunity to get feedback on the collections prior to the judging. Just kind of, I'm new to this, so I'm just, you know, I haven't, I didn't have the opportunity to see last right. year. You know, I, I did see that photograph. That was super helpful in the presentation. But, you okay. know, I, 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 I haven't started yet, but, you know, in general, I could imagine our team, um, you know, just wondering if if a certain thing is acceptable or or, or or not like procedurally not like uh, you know right. not a question about the science really Does that right. make sense? um no okay so you can't like send me a picture and say is this right that's not fair admissible enough. because it wouldn't be fair to everybody and for me to do that for everybody would be chaotic so if you have a question like if i have an insect that has only five legs is that specimen okay um, and you would type that into the FAQs online. Mm -hmm. And then I would answer, it comes to me, I would answer it, and then it's posted for everyone to see. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Yes. Rachel, Rachel has a question again. Yeah, I had one more question about... Um, what criteria do you use to decide whether the specimen should be in a vial or on a paper flag? Um, if it's a small insect, all of the insects, unless they're soft bodied for some reason, should be on a paper tag. So if it's a really small one, like a gnat, um, some of the smaller arthropods could also be on a paper tag. But for the most part, if it's a non insect, so a centipede, millipede, spider mite, it should probably be in a vial because they don't have a good way to pin them. Crayfish do, but otherwise it's very difficult to pin them. So roly polies, all those should be in the vials. And the vials are available through the quick start kits online uh, at the Science Olympiad website. Hot links are here. Um, other than that, all the insects should be either on a paper tag or pinned. Okay, you thank know, you. We have to come yeah. with that. Yeah. 
<laughs> we got marked down. Thank you. You're welcome. Michelle, how do you know if something is soft bodied? Maybe I missed that. I'm not an expert. Um, that usually refers to larva of the insects. And since those aren't admissible, so like a caterpillar would be soft body. Since those aren't admissible, it's usually not a problem. Um, for the most part, we're using the vials with the other arthropod classes other than insecta because they don't have a good place to put the pin and they the bodies tend to break. Like spiders don't have a good place to put the pin. People try to pin them and they do okay, but it's not great. So it's better to put those in a vial so all the parts are visible and they don't break as they're moving from place to place or break during pinning. So centipedes, millipedes, all those vials, way easier. Don't try to put them in, pin them. That's too difficult. Courtney has a question. Hiya, does each child in the event create their own container and their own styrofoam or is no. it a group event? It's yeah, so there's a team of one or two students for this event. So both students, if there's a team of two, would work together to put together the collection. And both of their names would appear on the collection with their team number and their school or group data. Um, they can make the, the labels individually. So if one student collected a grasshopper, their name would be on that one. Another student collected a butterfly, their name would be on that one. So they do have to identify who collected which specimen. So I have a related question, Michelle, in regards mm -hmm. to who's allowed to collect for the team. And I'd like to clarify also, just to remind you, we do have teams that will have alternate team members. Yes. Like So for instance, there might be a third student who's assigned, who's part of the Amazing Arthropods event team for the, for the school, but they're not officially competing at the tournament. So if they're an alternate team member, they are a team member as far as I'm concerned, because the day of they may be the one that's there. So their name should appear on the tag as well. And yes, they can collect. But so a student has to be on the event team to be on the event call. team. Is that true? Okay. Because that's the name that will appear as the collector on the tag. So they are the collector. Now, if you find something at home and you are know, sweeping up on the floor, set it aside and have your students say, oh, hey, that I'm going to use that specimen. Yeah, that's that's fine. As long as they're working with the insect and they're doing the pinning and everything else, um, you know, if you find something at work and bring it home, but your student is actually interacting with the specimen to put it in the collection. Does that make sense? So if an adult finds something at work, brings it home for the student, student decides to use it for the collection, the student does the pinning, labeling, all that stuff. That's fine with me. Does that make sense to everybody? It's hard for everybody to collectively answer, but we'll. we'll yeah, we'll okay. Yeah, because you're just, you're going to find things. Are. Yeah, as long as the students are the ones interacting with the specimen to put it in the collection. Please do not take pictures of specimens that you find at work or someplace else. The pictures must be taken by the students. That's up to them. But if you find something somewhere to use um, in the specimen collection, because I would have no way of distinguishing that anyway. But I want the students to be able to be the ones that actually put it together. Um, and the bulk of them, you know, don't be finding 20 specimens at work and give them to your kids. But you know, if you find something that works out, good. I we have had students actually go to the vet and ask for fleas. That's a source of fleas. Not every pet at home is going to have them, hopefully not. <laughs> but that is a species found in the Great Lakes region, um, and it's a way to find one. We have about five minutes left in our session, Michelle. Just for OK. Um, again, if you have any further questions, feel free to post them on the website. I'm going to finish up here just going through the resources that are available to you. So there's a lot of stuff posted for this event. I do recommend using as much of it as possible. Um, the study guide and um, the workbooks that are online, particularly the one that's there for the two orders for which um, many more body parts um, will be asked for um, labeling and identification. If you're not familiar with how to relax uh, specimens, pin them and use the files. There are some very good videos online from my predecessor supervisor. The scoring rubric is posted so you can download it, take a good look at it. Um, 
where you should ask questions online, and then there are test archives as well. So those are all things posted on the Macomb Science Olympiad website for amazing arthropods that you can go to. There are also some other suggested resources. This book right here is the one that my information will mostly be coming from. So if it says that a specific organism is in a specific class or order, and these are its characteristics, and this is where it's found, that is the definitive guide for that. Not all insects are listed there. It just has a spattering, but all of the orders are listed there as well as all of the arachnid classes. So this has all the information you'll probably need about them in one place. Don't have to go running around online. Books are still good. Um, so you can order it online. Oops, sorry, skipped ahead. Um, you can go visit museums and their collections. Michigan State University has a bug house and you can make an appointment to go and see their collections. Some nature centers do as well. And there are going to be workshops, um, it says down here. Those are posted online, so there are workshops you can go to to see how something like this would work. I highly recommend them if you get an opportunity to do that. That gives the students a sense of what they will be expected to do and what those specimens might look like. And if you have questions about identifying something, um, there's a website called Bug Guide. You can take a picture or describe your specimen, send it to them, and there are amateur and professional um, insect folks there who will be happy to try and answer your questions. So if it's an identification question, post it out there and they will be happy. Again, you don't need the genus and species for any of your specimens, but if you're having problems identifying the class or the order for the insects, that's a great place to go. So thanks for coming today. Um, very happy to be a part of this event. And again, if you have any questions, please post them to the website so those answers are available to everyone. Again, this video will be posted and there's a PDF that's going to be posted as well. So you can click on all the hot links that were here in the video for those resources um, and other items that were presented today. Any last minute questions? I have a comment to uh, reinforce the, the um, information about workshops. There are links on the website for the workshops that are available for arthropods. Both of the Metro Parks are offering workshops at various dates. Uh, registration is expected, and so uh, you'll find that opportunity online. And uh, if you do want to attend, make sure you register. Right. And then Science Olympiad also hosts the practice events that will be in March. So if you can um, participate in one of those, that's very helpful to the students as well. If you don't know which one you're uh, supposed to be going to, a good person to ask is your head coach. Uh, All right, any other questions? Tina has a question. Hi, I was just wondering, you mentioned going to museums and metro parks. Can pictures be taken there in inside of a museum or metro? OK, no, nope. no, those are their collections that they put together. And thank you, Tina, for uh, asking that question so we can clarify that. Um, students need to find the specimens that they take pictures of on their own. OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK, we're out of time, so we're going to okay. wrap this up. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy this snowy day.